I'm just waiting for the high sound, which I just got. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our regular Thursday night lecture series. And uh, obviously, today's presentation is a little bit different. Uh, of course, it's not Thursday night, but Thursday afternoon, and we don't have a lecture. Outside of that, it's quite similar. Uh, today, we are really delighted to uh, uh, go astray from our normal uh, procedure because we have a very, very special treat uh, for us. As some of you are aware, hopefully all of you at least a little bit aware, that uh, many years ago, before the advent of the uh, computers, and supercomputers that uh, uh, NASA employed a large number of women to do the calculations that our uh, machines now take care of. And today uh, we have a number of distinguished uh, uh, speakers, women who were the computers way back when. Uh, as the moderator, again a slightly different uh, change from a normal procedure, we have Lona Hauser. Uh, Lona is a newcomer. Uh, she only got here in 1961, so it's not quite 30 years that she's been here, and pretty soon we'll almost consider her a native. But uh, she came here, as I said, in 1961, towards the end of the era when these women were functioning as uh, computers. Uh, she has worked with them, she has known them, and uh, she has made the uh, uh, the transition and has uh, stayed through that uh, right now she's uh, working the uh, computer applications branch. So she has certainly seen and participated in the full range of the women serving as computers now through a woman who is having a computer serve her. And again, we welcome not only uh, Lona Hauser who will introduce our distinguished panel of uh, speakers, and I will now turn the program over to her. Lola, thank you very, very much. Now shall I turn this over? I can turn it off. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing, is this right? Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing many of these stories. I don't think I, should I put this on the table? Oh, okay. Is this okay? No, it's still. We'll take a momentary timeout. It's always a, uh, as in the football games, a uh, TV commercial timeout. <laughs> what should I'll I do with this? Uh, just leave it there, please, and Sam will <coughs> some adjusting on the game. Okay. I think these Control. microphones are supposed to take care of all of your. Okay. Okay. It's on. Okay. Okay. Now yeah. are we ready? Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have today. <laughs> In a minute, we're going to have. It. I think some of our new equipment's not working right. You want to talk now? It's on. Okay. I'm looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have today. Is this okay? All right. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the, the discussion is entitled when, when Computers Were Human, and we're going to get firsthand information or oral history from some of these women who actually we're, we're, we're still, still not we're doing still very good. Some problems. Well, should we maybe they just turn this off? Will I be picked up from there? <laughs> it's not that big. Well, I'm not going to do that much talking once I get things okay. going. All right, Kristen, you write up on the speaker right okay. there. Okay. I'll just talk. I'll just try to talk. If you lean back a little, instead of leaning forward as you've been doing that. Well, we'll try one more time. <laughs> Suppose I just turn it off. Yeah, then we don't get it on the tape. Oh, okay. You can turn it off, but the tape will I can. Okay. Okay. We're going to get first-hand information or oral history from the from some of the women who worked at Langley, called NACA, during the 1940s and 1950s. These were the days before the electronic computers or the supercomputers that we have now, which do the calculations for engineering problems for us. 
we are fortunate <coughs> to have these people with us. These people were the computers during that era. And these human computers have an advantage over the supercomputers that we have currently. They can tell us things that no one had to program them to tell us. Now, this is not going to be true 40 years from now about the supercomputers that we have. No one programmed them to tell us anything, so they're not going to tell us these things. Um, these human computers played a very important role at Langley, and we're eager to hear about their activities. I just want to briefly introduce each member of the panel and then let them do the talking. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they came to work at Langley. Helen and they'll just raise their hand or not or something so we'll know. Helen Willie is a native of Westmoreland County, Virginia, and she came to work at Langley December 5th, 1941. Marie Bircher is a native of Bland County, Virginia. She came to work in January of 1942. Rowena Becker is a native of Henderson, North Carolina, and came to work in July of 1942. Vivian Adair is a native of Clinton, South Carolina. She came to work in July of 1943. Kathleen Wicker is a native of Hamlet, North Carolina. She came to work in 1945. Emma Jean Landrum grew up in Franklin, North Carolina, and she came to work in 1946. Laura Bateman is a rare local native of Newport News, Virginia, <laughs> and came to work in 1947 or 1948. She'll have to see which one. <laughs> Katherine Johnson is a native of White Sulphur, West Virginia, and she came to work in 1953. We also have with us today Virginia Biggins, <clears throat> who is a native of Richmond, Virginia. She was not, is not a Langley employee, but she came to work at the Daily Press in 1958 and is currently still working there. And she was assigned to what was NACA, and we were in the transition between NACA and NASA at that time. Um, <clears throat> most of these women had the job title computer. That's what their title and their job description was. And many of them were signed to what is called the Central Computer Pool. Well, they have given me various names for this. But some of them were then loaned to divisions. But now this is their story, and it's their reminiscence. But I want to be sure that you know that comments and questions from the audience are certainly welcome. And just remember that we are reminiscing, though. Um, and first of all, we're going to start with Helen. Willie, if you will start, Helen, tell us about your background. Um, how you came here, and then we would like to go all around the table and let everyone tell us at least something, and then we'll just continue from there. Well, I, I came, I was uh, living in Newport News at the time uh, that I applied at here. I, I really didn't, I'd just been there, I didn't come to, to Newport News, and I really didn't plan to work. I, I thought I would like to stay at home and keep house, but my next door neighbor was so anxious to come work and, and she said let's go ahead to, to NACA and, and see if we can get a job. So I said okay I'll, I'll go with you and uh, so when we signed the little papers that, that they wouldn't take your paper unless you said you would work six months. So I said okay I'll work six months and um, that was uh, early December. I got a notice to come to work on the 5th of December in uh, 1941. Why, why on Friday I'll never tell you. <laughs> um, but Friday it was, and of course you know what happened on Sunday. And so you just didn't leave the job for a while. Uh, if you would work on the 7th of December 1941, you just stayed on a defense job. And so my, my six months lengthened into 31 and a half years. <laughs> Wonderful years in which I saw the transition from this uh, very crude, work that we were doing in a way, it, it wasn't crude, it was very technical, but looking at it now you would think it was, where we uh, calculated all of the results that were brought to us by hand uh, from the wind tunnel um, and put it on sheets of paper, which you can see uh, some of these, some of the data sheets. One is, there's an original by Rowena Beck over here. Um, we stayed in the pool, the computing pool. I stayed in there for a few weeks, about three weeks, I think. 
and uh, and which as you said with the calculator in front of us it might have been a comptometer those awful sounding noisy things or a uh, marchant which my boss liked best she she insisted on using a marchant herself or a freedom calculator it was a big this big and a hand calculator mechanical which we sat and we wrote down, you know, we calculated this figure and we put the, took the data from over here and wrote down laboriously this column of paper. Not only on, of, of numbers, not only that, but then we passed it over here to Rowena and Rowena recalculated that, or, or Imogene or somebody who was in the booth, recalculated that, but put a little red dot by anyone that she might find that was wrong. Anyhow, after a while, um, I heard that that some of the sections were going to, by the way, they not only called us computers, but we had the demeaning uh, title of junior computer science. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get in because I, I had a math major and uh, from out of Michael Women's College in Lynchburg and, and had been on with my master's at Columbia, and so I, I did come in as a computer. Sixteen hundred and twenty dollars a year, and um, that lasted a pretty good long time because our, our, our salary sort of got stuck. But anyhow, um, I heard that we were going to be uh, sent. Maybe out. some of the divisions wanted their own people right there instead of having to send the men down, up and down the streets, bring in data from the from the uh, wind tunnels. And we were doing mostly eight-foot tunnel work. So here they appeared a wooden desk. We all had metal desks. They appeared a wooden desk in the middle of the room. We said, what's that for? And uh, we'd been working for John Stack. And, and those of you who don't know John Stack, who did not know John Stack, know him by <laughs> reputation, <laughs> um, he was marvelous. But we heard him and seen him. And, and then I heard that, that I was going to be sent out of the computing pool to a division. And I said, a wooden desk and a cussing boss. <laughs> <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me in my whole career. When I re retired 31 and a half years later, I <coughs> told them that I was, they were like Hallmark. They cared enough to send me the very best. I started out with John Stack. I retired under Dick Whitcomb. And in between, I'd had people like Jean Draley as boss and Axel Matson had worked with people like John Becker and Don Bales and so many of the people who had went had then into other sections and other divisions uh, on the field and became leaders and uh, stars in their own role, own, own right, in other roles. So I've taken up enough time. I think I've done. <laughs> okay, Marie, would you like to tell us some of the things about how you got here? I first came in a yacht into the Hampton Yacht Club, and when I went around and entered that beautiful spot by the Hampton Institute, as it was called then, I thought it was the most beautiful place I had ever seen. Of course, I hadn't traveled very much, because I was from Bland County, Virginia. <laughs> And I heard about these wonderful jobs at NASA, at NACA. And I wrote a letter and applied for a job. And I got back an application and I filled it out. And I was working about two months later at the computer pool, the same one Helen was in. And then I also was sent down to that wonderful spot under Mr. Stack and worked there for a uh, good many good while and then I was transferred to the 16 foot tunnel and worked under some of the nice people she's mentioned, John Becker and Blake Corson and all in all as I, I came in today we were talking about the wonderful people we worked with the group of girls were exceptional we had we didn't have air conditioning we opened up the windows. We worked on New Year's Day. I don't know whether we worked very much, but we we were there. <laughs> uh, and I never heard many complaints from these very 
outstanding young ladies who worked as human computers, you might say. Okay, Rowena, would you? Uh... Well, there was no question in my mind when I saw that the teachers of North Carolina were going to be given $550 per year compared to the $1620 that they offered here. So as a math major, I came down in 1942. I went straight to the computer pool and stayed there for about six months before they, uh, Helen decided to have a baby and that meant that they needed another computer to come to the eight foot tunnel. And they put us in a little cubicle of uh, three desks right beside the front door and there we worked away. Now, uh, I grew to enjoy a part of the work they called engineering aid, they called us. And we would go into the tunnel as they were running the test. Now, I noticed as we came into the building, uh, the big computer section, they, uh, the running of the tunnel itself was displayed there. But in, in my day, we took our big long slide rules, about like so, and we looked up at large, um, round dials and we would take the reading off the dial and work out uh, the formulas and so forth and let the engineer know how his uh, test there was working out whether it was running the true line that he had expected or what the picture was and then he might want to rerun the point again but that was uh, interesting. We ran at high pressure, you know, and went in and out with the uh, com with the engineers there. Well, now they tell me there's nothing like um, uh, getting under a, a good engineer and working up. And uh, my husband was working there at the eight foot tunnel when I first got there, but first then moved over to the 16 foot tunnel and was the one that uh, Bertie was talking about uh, there. So we, I only worked for a little over five years, but enjoyed every minute of it, I assure you. Vivian, you came in 1943. Would you like to uh, tell us something? <coughs> yes, I graduated from Bernal College, which at that time, and I suppose still is, a conservatory with a mathematics degree and a major in French, if you can imagine such a combination. <laughs> and I taught school for six years, and then I took a civil service examination. And in the summer of 1943, I was told that I would be hired at NACA in Langley Field, Virginia. I had never heard of Langley Field, Virginia, <laughs> but I can't hear. And I sat for three days waiting to be hired. All that time, I, my money was gradually depleting. <laughs> I was hired as a sub-professional rather than a professional. <coughs> and with the same degree that I had was hired as a professional. But no, the women were sub-professionals. Uh, I was sent to the uh, computing pool under Virginia Tucker and that was then in the 19 foot building <coughs> on the east side. Later I was sent to the TDT tunnel which was a two-dimensional tunnel under Eastman Jacobs, another name that most some of you will remember. And he drove to work with the a book on his steering wheel, if you can imagine that. <laughs> uh, I worked under some very uh, well-known engineers at the time, one of which was Paul Hubel, who still lives in uh, Newport News, and Coleman Donaldson was a one of the engineers that was a great help to me in the gas dynamics division after I was transferred from CDT. Another famous uh, engineer was Arthur Kentrowitz. And uh, 
when the gas dynamics division under Cantorbridge was formed, we had some uh, foreign engineers. Uh, Dr. Busemann from Germany came, and I worked with him. I also worked with uh, Antonio Ferry from Italy. And I understand from a friend that I met last night that his wife is still living in the United States and goes back and forth to uh, Europe quite often. Then, uh, as years passed, I was sent to the Bell Computing Section, where I then worked with uh, Kathleen Wicker, and I think she'll tell you more about that than, than I can. But during these years, during the war, you all, did you all work five days a week then? Six days we a week. six days a week. Six days a week. And, that, and the sixth day was not overtime. <laughs> Regular work week. Oh, and, and then uh, after the bell computing, I was transferred to the ACD. The, well, in, even before that, we became a small computing group up in the 19-foot tunnel again. And there we worked with IBM machines that we uh, programmed our own boards. And that was the beginning of the mechanical. That was a, that was around the 60s or late 50s then, mm -hmm. early yes. 60s or late 50s, late, late 50s. 50s. Mm -hmm. But Kathleen, you came in 1945. Right. Uh, I was recruited in college. About that time, they started recruiting. I was at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and Virginia Tucker came down and recruited, and several from my class came, and uh, we were sent to the pool. But we were also told there were um, four of us that came from my class at the same time. And we were told that we would be in the pool right then, but we were slated to work with the Bell computer when it came in. Well, at that time, I hardly knew what a computer was. I thought they were women, you know. But I found out that that was, <laughs> that was the first computer that Langley was to have, or one of the first. I believe they had some IBM machines. But uh, the Bell computer was the first, uh, I guess you could call it the forerunner of the modern computers. Uh, it was built by the telephone company. And it was very much like a um, an old-time telephone switchboard, um, not the part where they stuck the wires in, but the back part, the the relays that uh, ran the system. And this was a relay machine, and every operation caused a relay to open or shut. And you could stand there and watch the relays opening and shut, and you could almost tell what was going on by the sound of it. And uh, it was, um, you know, fantastically slow by today's standards, but at the time, it was a miracle to us the way it could do it. Um, it was uh, extremely fast, uh, like two seconds of operation maybe, uh, for, everything <laughs> <laughs> for everything except division. Now, on division, you could stand there and hear it clicking away, and it was no faster on division than an old freedom machine was. But uh, we thought it was fantastic, you know. We could do all these things, and so far as we ever knew, that machine never made a mistake. Now, you know, we may have told it some wrong things to do, but uh, it did what we told it to do and never made a mistake. And uh, it, was, it was great. It was wonderful experience because you really got down to the basics, and uh, we had no trouble going from that machine and just progressing on up. Uh, you had to learn a different language and a different code, but uh, you had learned the fundamentals from that. And uh, you didn't have any trouble when uh, things got better and better as they did through the years. And I continued to work with computers uh, for <coughs> about 30 years also, about 35 years. And, uh, okay. So. Uh, Imogene, you came in 1946. Uh, yes. Um, I was 
a graduate of Women's Co uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. It was Women's College then. Uh, and uh, I was more or less recruited by Virginia Tucker. Actually, what happened was uh, it was about a month before school was out, and a number of us were complaining because we didn't have jobs. And our head of the department, Dr. Barton, said, well, let me check with Virginia Tucker and see if she needs anybody up there at Langley. And so she contacted Jenna, and Jenna wrote back and said, send all you can get. So the six of us, all told from the class of 12 math majors, came up here. <laughs> uh, the day I came to work, two, two other classmates came with me, and one of the first people we saw on the bus into Langley was Vivian, who had been on leave and was coming back to work. Uh, and she showed us where to go and all got us started out. Uh, I did not go to the computing pool. The other two girls did. Uh, I had almost a double major in math and physics. And so they said, well, we're going to send you down to one of the wind tunnels um, because they need somebody down there and we think you might fit in better as well down there as anybody else. So, so I went down to the 24-inch tunnel. Now, that tunnel was down in the area where Vivian had worked at TDT and we were in a building that uh, called Building 60, which was uh, where the atmospheric wind tunnel had been just phased out. And uh, we were upstairs in a, offices in a hallway, more or less, with windows open to the west sun, hot as Hades all the time. In the summertime, many of the time I've gone home uh, because it was so warm that when I leaned back in my chair, I got varnish on the back of my blouse. Uh, I worked there and eventually became uh, the supervising computer of a number of other computers. And uh, along the way, uh, I was fortunate in, in working with some people who let me sort of stretch my wings and eventually I was reclassified as a, a research engineer and I spent the last about 20 years of my career as a research engineer doing basic aeronautical research on airfoils and wings and, and uh, bodies. Uh, uh, one of the things that sticks in my mind uh, is some of the, as, as I mentioned, some of the people we met. I share Harold and Helen's uh, uh, memories of John Stack. The first time I ever saw him, I was sitting in the hallway uh, at my desk, and someone came up the stairway, and the air was absolutely blue. <laughs> and this uh, guy came roaring by back into the, se the section head's office, and they slammed the door shut, and then you could just hear all this going on. And when he left, I said, who was that? And they said, John Stack. Well, sometime later, I was, uh, my, my boss did right much work with Mr. Stack, and Mr. Stack was then over as an assistant uh, head of the center, and they were doing some research, and one morning, uh, Mary Mayline Carroll who was Mr. Stack's secretary, called me up and said, uh, Emma Jean, uh, Dick said, that, Dick Lindsay was my boss, said, Dick volunteered you to do some work for Mr. Stack today. <laughs> and I said, oh. She said, yes. <laughs> Could you come over? And, and I went over to his office, shaking like a leaf, because I had never seen him except in this state of agitation. <laughs> I walked in to the office. He greeted me. I got the most lucid explanation of what I, he wanted without one cuss, cuss word at all. <laughs> he, he gave me the most lucid request of what he, and I, when I walked out of there, I knew exactly what he wanted. No ifs, ands, and buts. No one has ever, ever did that to me before or since. And in about 30 minutes, I had the job done, went back and gave it to him. He said, you through? I said, sure. I said, I had everything you needed. Um, he remembered that many years later when uh, the request went through to, tra to change me from uh, a supervising computer to a research engineer. And he says, oh yeah, she's the one who did some work for me. I think she'd do all right for that job. <laughs> so it, it, it pays off in the end. Uh, one other little thing, 
I did not work with Dr. Ferry or Dr. Fusman, although I knew both of them. Uh, Dr. Ferry never learned to speak the English language. <laughs> he always talked with a mouthful of mush. <laughs> right. Always and had he, an interpreter. Right, and, and he always had, there were two Italian-American engineers who worked for him, Lucini and Nucci, and he never went anywhere without either or both of Luke, uh, Luke or, I forget now what. Mike Lucini. Mike. Uh, Lucini or Nucci. Uh, Dr. Busman, on the other hand, made a concerted effort to learn the English language. He would investigate every little nuance in the language. And many of the day he came in, one, I remember one afternoon he came into the office and he stood there and I said, what can we do for you, Dr. Guzman? He said, uh, he said, you know those things that the Chinese use to count with? And I said, yeah, an abacus. And he said, yeah. He says, what are those little things on there that, that they use to count with? And I said, they're beads. He said, well, what are those things you wear around your neck? And I said, they're beads. This is the kind of thing he was interested in. And, he, and one day he came in and asked, what's the difference between, between hard and difficult? Now, someone who's grown up with English language, that's second nature. You never think about the difference. But he, he, he did that. He also got uh, quite Americanized because he had three teenage daughters who became Americanized very quickly. Uh, That'll do it. That's right. Uh, let's see, Laura, you came in 1947 or 48 now. You can tell I us. Think, I think I probably came in 48. <laughs> and, uh, Melvin Butler uh, hired me at the time. I, I think he was in charge of hiring as the vice mayor of Hampton. Uh, and I went right to work in Cascade Aerodynamics, which later became no, it was start off, it was rotating machines, aerodynamics, later became cascade aerodynamics. And the first encounter I had with Tony Ferry, we had to go over to the building that you worked in. He, Dr. Ferry wanted us to do something. And I, we all just said, everybody listen real close because we couldn't understand a word he said. We just kept <laughs> nodding and hoping somebody got the message and we could do all these calculations that he wanted. And uh, I've worked with the Freedom Calculators, and uh, I think our group in Cascade, well, other groups too, but in 1948, we had, they hired the first black women from Hampton Institute, and we had three in our office, and they were wonderful. Two of them, their husbands were studying to be doctors at Howard University, and uh, just, they became part of the group, and it was wonderful. It all worked out. There was no problems like everybody, I think, in Hampton and Newport News thought that the world was coming to an end, but uh, that all worked out. Our, our group moved from the east area to the west area. We were in the structures building for a while until we had our new building built. And then Cascade Aerodynamics had their own building in with gas dynamics. And doctors, John Stack, I'm talking about being scared. I was terrified because at one point they said the only way you get so far across the board in your raises and you can't go any further as a computer or an engineer and aide. And, and they, so I helped Jack Irwin, who was my boss and Manny Boxer, do this very technical report that John Stack had to review. And I guess it went through th three review boards before whatever it was approved and uh, then I became an engineering aide. So you were actually your name was was on you were as an author on the report? Then? Yes with Jack Irwin <coughs> but uh, I guess I don't know I, I can tell many stories that we were just talking today <laughs> about uh, she asked me if I played basketball or softball I said I played basketball for the Sky Chicks and then men had the Skyhawks basketball team and they had super men players because they were college, played in all these great colleges and they were here and they played all the military bases around. And uh, Was this a basketball team formed from Langley? Yes, yeah, so it was all oh, these women who, a lot, well, a lot of them, uh, I mean all of them were, were 
computers, <laughs> our secretaries and what have you, and we play the Navy women and uh, different groups. And I, I, I was saying relating today, I said I met somebody one time and she said, well, I played for the power company and we were called the Kilowatt Cuties. <laughs> <laughs> We, we were not that glamorous. We were just sky chicks. So these were diversions outside the television wasn't around at that time either, right? No. no. Catherine, you came in 1953. Is that right? Would you like to tell us something? <clears throat> I, I came in the summer of 1953 and was assigned first off to the uh, West Computers, which was the, uh, the pool for the black women employees. And I was there under Dot Vaughn, whom everybody in ACD had great respect for. She was fantastic. So I was there a couple weeks and then I was loaned to Henry Pearson in the Flight Research Division. And one of my bosses is right back there. Mm -hmm. um, we were the pioneers of the space area era. And just to show you what computers did in those days. We had to handwrite the equations, compute the results, and then handwrite them in the reports. And I brought one for you to see. The uh, figures are all hand drawn, and uh, we thought we did a fantastic job because there was no other way to do those. So I would like for you to look at this when it's done. Uh, in particular, we were very proud of the fact that we started the work on space when it was a secret. Sputnik had been put up and you know, nothing they thought was going on over here. But NACA was working on this secret. We didn't know what we were working on. These people tell you that you put a big sheet of paper in front of you with a flock of equations. These equations are here. And you computed the results and there was the trajectory. And uh, you had to read Aviation Week to find out what you'd done. <laughs> because they knew, you know, whenever you want a big secret job, you could bet that Aviation Week would report on it for you. We were responsible for calculating the space with the launch windows. And uh, <coughs> they would tell us when, where they wanted the capsule to land at a certain, at the time, the location and the time. Then we would sit down at the desk with this batch of equations and compute the launch window. And when Glenn was going to make that very first trip, by this time we'd moved into computers, but they called over from ACD and said, now we've done this on the computer, but we want you all to check and see if it's right. <laughs> so we did it by hand and they said, okay, he can go now, this is all right. So we felt very, very proud. I think what is most interesting is the fact that the engineers had great confidence in us and we had a tremendous curiosity as to what was going on. I remember being uh, the only computer who went to an editorial meeting, I used to go to the briefings because we were that interested in what was going on. And so over time, we, they ceased to call us the computer, and we became uh, aides and aerospace technologists and engineers like everybody else. I spent 33 years here. There were great years I enjoyed every single day. Virginia, as a newspaper uh, lady who came here in 1958 covering NACA, would you like to add something to that? Well, I, I will say that the women were a deep, dark secret. I never got to beat them. I, I, when I came out to do a story, I assumed they were all secretaries. Everybody said, this is a scientist or an engineer, and it was always a man that I interviewed. And there was a language barrier, even if they weren't foreigners, because they talk in equations all the time. And, I mean, it was very difficult in the beginning to understand what, what they were getting at. And as far as uh, the space program, when the space program came into being, that was the most exciting time because they had people, NASA hired people, that could talk to the public and tell them what was going on. And it was much more fun. 
we, we began, instead of looking at awe at the people that worked at NASA, we appreciated that they were brains. But they never let us know what they were going, they were doing, and they sort of looked down on us as, you know, why should we tell these people they wouldn't understand anyway? Well, it was their money coming in here to pay for their products, so they should have clued us in on some of the things. And so, uh, but when the space program came into being, that was the most exciting time because they had Dr. Gilruth who could talk with the people so well. John Stack could talk to people even. He was gruff at times. Uh, <laughs> uh, Max Vajay, he was, he was a very interesting, the rocket man was very interesting. And uh, then the, of course, the astronauts, we sort of related to them. They were the most exciting ones. And uh, they also, their first offices had no air conditioning, and they had no screens <coughs> on their windows, and they were on the second floor. Their offices were on the second floor of what is now the TAC uh, auditorium over <coughs> on the other side of the base. And, uh, but the women, as I said, they, they did a heck of a job and no one was aware they were around. And my question is, what did the engineers do before you all came aboard? <laughs> <laughs> they sat down there and, and did it themselves. Well, uh, <laughs> did they, did they, so they really did it before you all came. They did the calculations with the Freedons? Actually, actually what, uh, these, these fellows who preceded us, the engineers that we came to work for, were, many of them were mathematicians themselves uh, and physicists. And uh, they were on the cutting edge of aerodynamics. Uh, people don't really realize that NACA was responsible for many of the aerodynamic uh, advances prior to World War II and do, during World War II. Um, the engine cowling was developed here at Langley and various other uh, things. Uh, I think that in the rush to space that when Sputnik went up in 1958, there was such a change in the attitude Everybody went from aerodynamics to space immediately and forgot about the aerodynamics part of it. <coughs> and uh, I think that was a great loss to the country because we were on the cutting edge of developing a lot of things that we could use today in aerodynamics that just went down the drain because there was no money to, to take care of it and, and do the space also. Uh, when it came to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, why? Uh, uh, it became space primarily. There was aeronautics, but, but uh, we always felt like we were sort of the stepchild. Helen, you alluded to something that I have a question about. You alluded to these checkers and a red <coughs> mark. What did you do when these red marks occurred? This was all by hand, and I can see so many places for errors. Well, well that's just, just, just correct me. <laughs> <laughs> but when did you know? I mean, did you have to just take two out of three, or what did you do? No, we only did two. And then we'd give it back to the, give it back to the person who originally did it and, and get her to agree that, that it was incorrect. So then you had an agreement. Sometimes you had we to start way back <laughs> from the very beginning okay. and follow it all the way through. Well, we, we, in, in, the, in the pool there with, with Jenna Tucker, you remember, we, we would finish one column and then pass it on to somebody else. We didn't go all the way through. And those things had like one column at a time? Mm -hmm. A hundred columns of columns? Yes. yes. And we had this we, one. We one also one. had little yeah. pink pearls. And this is an eraser that's a very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sheet. That's why we need to share this because I think this is her writing. I think this is one that she did. I don't see any... any uh, red dots on it. <laughs> <laughs> that speaks well for maybe, a week. Maybe no one really checked it, but uh, <laughs> that was what we called a pressure distribution, that it took lots and lots of figures, and it shows you just how many, when well, you worked on it for a, um, a week at a time. <laughs> this particular thing, of course, was theoretical, was theory. It was theoretical. Was but theory, we yeah. did do the same thing with wind tunnel, mm -hmm. with the results from the wind tunnels. Mm -hmm. And those would be also in columns up here. Sometimes with no titles, because a lot of what we were doing was secret, as you well know. 
and sometimes there would be no titles at all, just numbers. And there's these columns are numbered. And we would multiply column this by column 10 by column 15 and put the result in column 16. And subtract column 4 and put it in column 17. That's such ridiculous. That sounds ridiculous now. Now, we haven't, haven't told them that we even went into dark rooms and with uh, magnifying glasses and whatnot, read the film. That's, that's what I'm saying. We were missing the one thing, that where this data came from to begin with. Yes. They had manometer boards, which were, uh, has, some of them had scales on them. Later on, we had ones that did not have scales. And uh, uh, you had to go in and with a magnifying glass, read what the height of the mercury or the carbon tat or whatever fluid they were using in it. And then that had to be translated and, and, and then the, the data calculated. And that became a pressure distribution which right. we hand plotted on, on And then you used a, a, a planimeter to integrate it to come out with, with the forces and moments I think on that's it. what that big picture is over there. I think, was, that, was that using a planimeter on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, when the yeah. first IBM machines they got were an IRD because we had, yes. they yes. could read that, yeah. those mercury tubes mm -hmm. And then well, well, one of the, they, they, they used those IBM machines. I was just so fascinated with those cards. Well, years later, I would go into the meeting <coughs> section to talk to some of the girls about something, and, and one somebody would be complaining about having to go over to, to ACD to read film. <coughs> and I, I had no sympathy for them whatsoever, <laughs> because all they had to do was go over there and line the thing up and sit there and pat their foot. No, I was reading. And, 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 I was and we it. had to sit and read with a magnifying glass. And uh, in, in my section, we had worked out, one of the engineers had come up with a little gadget that we could put uh, a couple of cons, it was, uh, we had it built here on the field, and it was a very, uh, detailed graduated scales on a, a sort of a figure four, we called it a figure four. And uh, it was really a right triangle with uh, with a pressure coefficients on the hypotenuse. And by changing the height and length of the two legs, you could uh, calc you actually automatically calculated what the pressure coefficient was. If you lined that up on the film, you could just slide it along and read the pressure coefficients. Well, it took two people to do this, and you had to set the thing up, and we had no air conditioning, it was hot, we had these great old big chairs, some of them, these high back business type chairs. And if you didn't get them just right, you could tip them over real easy. And many of the day, I've been sitting there hot, sleepy, listening to her and writing things down. And then all of a sudden, I doze off, flop over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, then for, and in those days, no one wore slacks. You wore dresses. And, it's most embarrassing to be sitting there with your legs over a chair <laughs> and an engineer trying to help you get up. <laughs> now, I can recall when we read the film in the dark room on the third floor of ACD. I spent my, the first three years of my NACA life on the third floor reading in the dark room. And some of you might remember Montgomery, who was in charge <laughs> of the machines. Yes. Marty. Monty could repair anything with two paper clips and a piece of chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> this, this actually is not a planimeter. We had one somewhere. But this is reading with this with this type of magnifying glass. This is reading those manometer, the mm -hmm. heights of those tubes. On Basically, what, what got me, uh, one of the things that, that, trans, uh, that uh, precipitated my being changing from a computer to an engineer was the fact that we uh, we had started trying to develop a method by which we could integrate uh, working with IRD to integrate things and and write out number uh, let gauges just give us numbers or dials to give us numbers which we could then translate into lift and drive and pitching moment and uh, the engineer who was I was working with the engineer who was working with IRD. And we were just at the point to start uh, checking and doing our checking on it when the engineer ups and leaves. Well, I knew what it would mean to us in our section if we could get this thing to work. Uh, so I volunteered to work with IRD because I knew more about it than anybody else and the other engineers couldn't care less. Because we were doing their, da their data for them so they didn't, they didn't care how it got there as long as they got it. 
and we ended up uh, uh, that was the, my first job working with uh, uh, data and, and uh, as, a, as an engineer type rather and eventually uh, I started running my own data Let's tell them something in out of the engineering area and what lunchtime was like in the ni early 1940s. They gave us an hour, I think. We actually, it was supposed to be a half hour, but we went down and you had a card of your own. Do any of Oh, you wouldn't remember that. But you had a card and you wrote down uh, Walter Riser, the head of the... Uh, cafeteria there uh, would write down your 35 cents that you paid for your lunch and put it you would put it up in a little rack and only at the end of the month did they uh, add it all up and you paid what you owed for your lunches but rarely were the lunches more than 35 cents and that was in about uh, from 42 to 45 do you remember Mr. Stack always got ice cream with his lunch and ate it with his lunch? He didn't wait till it was dessert. He ate it with lunch. And for fear that you think we are maligning John Stack, please, please don't think that. That's just a characteristic. He was one of the best people that anybody ever worked for. And he I want to ask his people. Well, excuse me, Jill. I want to put in a good word for Tony because it's mighty nice visiting him over in Italy too. Because and you don't have a bit of trouble understanding him when he's talking over there in Italy. <laughs> he does a good job. <laughs> and in the early years of the war, we didn't have enough freedoms or, or calculating machines to go around, so we worked on shi on a shift basis. Each person. There were six of us in the eight-foot tunnel, and we had three desks and three machines. And so when we came in to work, uh, we sat down at who at the morning shift's desk or the evening shift desk. But at that time, you were very close to the water, very close to... Uh, uh, there was just a little walkway between. I, and as you worked your freedom machine, you could look right out there and see the sailboats going up and down the water there. It was very tempting, and it was also tempting to go sailing with the engineers when they asked you to after work. And do you remember when we graduated from the freedom to the Wang, we thought we'd died and gone to heaven. We had a little desk calculator that was only this big, and, and it could, like so. The Wang was the best thing that had happened to us for years. Mm -hmm. Well, no, we didn't work on Saturdays. That long. That's er, that's and a we lot got, of We time. could get compensatory <laughs> leave, so and we could come in at seven o'clock. So you talk about sailing. Yeah. Many of the time we would work late, and then we could take off at noon you, with our compensatory <laughs> leave <laughs> and go out sailing. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, something that happened to us. Uh, I came to work almost at the end of the war time but i remember working on uh i came in june and we had to work on the fourth of july because uh you know the war was still going on and at that time very few people had cars and of course none of us <coughs> that were just out of college had cars so we had to ride the uh, bus from uh out from out here into hampton and so that week uh, there was a bus that can, we were on the night shift. Not only did we have to work on the 4th of July, but we had to work at night. Mm -hmm. And there was a bus that came along about midnight, so we had to hurry that from the end of our shift to catch the bus. That was over on the east side, and the bus came along right in front of where the PX is. I guess it still is. And we had to catch it. Well, on the night of the 4th of July, we ran out to catch our bus, bus didn't come. So we waited and waited and waited and we didn't know how we were going to get into Hampton then. And finally, four of us waiting there for the bus and uh, an airman in a car came along and offered to take us to Hampton. So we all four piled in the car and he took us into Hampton. And <laughs> so that was my memory of my first 4th of July around here. How long did the bus ride take normally if the bus had come? Oh, I guess it was about 30 minutes, maybe. Uh, 
Did you live in apartments or boarding? How did, what did you all live? Well, I lived in what was the, at that time the old Ann With residence hall. It was out in the With area of Hampton behind where the uh, Kicktown Court apartments are yeah. now. And it was just this little residence hall. It had a little, they weren't much more than cubicles, but it was, you know, a place to live. And uh, most of us lived there for a while anyway until we could make other arrangements and find an apartment with someone else. Many of us in the early days of the war uh, stayed in private homes. Mm -hmm. I stayed in Dr. Wright's home. And um, we also had riding combinations the engineer that had the car would go around and pick us all up and take us, bring us into work and deliver us back. We, a car was not supposed to come out here that was not filled with people. Riding combinations was the order of the day. Well, that was gas was rationed during that time. Gas was rationed. I think we and paid a dollar a week once. I think that's it. Yeah. A dollar a week for our ride. For our ride. <laughs> for our ride. <laughs> My, fr my first residence was a converted uh, filling station <laughs> <laughs> out on Kickatan Road, uh, just west of the Width area. And there were six of us that lived there, and, and we had to find food wherever we could. There were no mm -hmm, facilities for eating. This has been a delightful hour. I wonder if any of our members in our audience would like to participate in any stories or questions? NACA, I'm not familiar with the program. Excuse me. Okay. The question was NACA. You would like to know what that stands for. National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. <laughs> it was originated in 1915 to do aeronautical research. And that was its basis until the act in 1958 when it was combined on the basis of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We were all known as NACA nuts among the, the Hampton <laughs> Area. We were knocking nuts. Do any of you all recall or did you participate with any of them that were in the Little Theater? I understand there were quite a few. Floyd Thompson was in the Little Theater. Quite a few of here. They were. I just wondered if maybe, you know, y'all, since you played basketball and softball, <laughs> and they had a green, we, green cow dance. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we had a question here. I'd like you to ask it into the mic so we can get it on the uh, tape, please. Well, this is a co this is a comment more than a question. Some people have raised uh, the question of pay and things like that. At least in the 40s, uh, there were a few human c calculators or computers that were men. Uh, and secondly, whether they were men or women, there were sometimes two categories of qualifications. There were many who were very well qualified as mathematicians in their own right. And there were other computers who were largely um, going through uh, a routine that somebody else set up. And this resulted in three levels of pay, one for the men, second for the women, and third for the uh, junior computers. Uh, I, think, I think our complaint was the fact that uh, even though we might have been qualified for some of the higher paying jobs, we weren't considered for them. Well, yes, there was a discrimination in terms of, there was a discrimination because engineers were paid more than mathematicians. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Is Mr. Stack still around? The question is, Mr. Stack still around? Mr. Stack passed away many, a number of years ago. He was killed in an accident with his horse. We uh, really are just about out of time. Do we have maybe one other question or comment that somebody would like to make? Did you? Okay. It, it wasn't the norm at that time for women to work, was it, and raise families? Who took care of your children? And did you get comments from friends, etc., for having a career? I resigned as soon as I became pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked through two, my two, my two children took off six months leave with each child. I had a practical nurse with my first child, and uh, 
then my father, who was living with us, said when she was three months old, I'd like to try my hand with her by myself. And he did. And that was one of the most wonderful experiences for that child, to have a grandfather take care of her, and roll her down Hilton streets and all the nice things that, uh, that a grandfather only could do. That's wonderful. Before I make my uh, uh, final comments, I think uh, all of these ladies uh, deserve a tremendous round of applause. I would like to wrap up just making a couple of uh, comments. First of all, some months ago, Dr. Jim Hansen, who's sitting in the audience right now, gave a fantastic presentation on the history of NACA during their anniversary uh, time. And at that time, I told him and others how much I thoroughly enjoyed his presentation. It was great. However, Jim, I have to tell you, having anybody, no matter who it is, telling the history, the story of others, cannot compete with the people who lived the history, the people who actually did it, the people who were there, is something uh, that is another dimension. <coughs> and I think all of us here today who are privileged to, to be here, to listen to these women, truly uh, uh, have had an exceptional experience. Uh, Ladies, I cannot thank you enough, not only for what you did at the time when you made NACA or NASA what it was in terms of the work that you did, but also your sharing your stories, your insight, uh, your anecdotes with us today. I know for myself personally, and I trust for the rest of the people in attendance here, that uh, you have added a tremendous amount to our understanding of what uh, went on. And I certainly give you my personal thanks as well as the thanks for all who are here. And again, much health. Virginia Biggins, who is a native of Richmond, Virginia. She was not, is not a Langley employee, but she came to work at the Daily Press in 1958 and is currently still working there. And she was assigned to what was NACA and we were in the transition between NACA and NASA at that time. Um, <clears throat> most of these women had the job title computer. That's what their title and their job description was. And many of them were signed to what is called the Central Computer Pool. Well, they have given me various names for this. But some of them were then loaned to divisions. But now this is their story, and it's their reminiscing. But I want to be sure that you know that comments and questions from the audience are certainly welcome. And just remember that we are reminiscing, though. Um, and first of all, we're going to start with Helen. Willie, if you will start, Helen, tell us about your background, um, how you came here. And then we would like to go all around the table and let everyone tell us at least something. And then we'll just continue from there. Well, I, I came. I was uh, living in Newport News at the time uh, that I applied at here. I, I really didn't, I'd just been married, I didn't come to, to Newport News, and I really didn't plan to work. I, I thought I would like to stay at home and keep house, but my next door neighbor was so anxious to come to work, and, and she said, let's go ahead to, to NACA and, and see if we can get a job. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go with you. And uh, so when we signed the little papers, that, that they wouldn't take your paper unless you said you would work six months. So I said, okay, I'll work six months. And um, that was uh, early December. I got a notice to come to work on the 5th of December in uh, 1941. Why, why on Friday? I'll never tell you. Uh, <laughs> but Friday it was. And of course, you know what happened on Sunday. And so you just didn't leave the job for a while. Uh, if you would work on the 7th of December, 1941, you just stayed on a defense job. And so my, my six months lengthened into 31 and a half years wonderful years in which I saw the transition from this uh, very national oral history from the from some of the women who worked at Langley called NACA during the 1940s and 1950s these were the days before the electronic computers or the supercomputers that we have now which do the calculations for engineering problems for us we're fortunate <coughs> to have these people with us. These people 
were the computers during that era. And these human computers have an advantage over the supercomputers that we have currently. They can tell us things that no one had to program them to tell us. Now, this is not going to be true 40 years from now about the supercomputers that we have. No one programmed them to tell us anything, so they're not going to tell us these things. Um, these human computers played a very important role at Langley, and we're eager to hear about their activities. I just want to briefly introduce each member of the panel and then let them do the talking. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they came to work at Langley. Helen and they'll just raise their hand or not or something so we'll know. Helen Willie is a native of Westmoreland County, Virginia, and she came to work at Langley December 5th, 1941. Marie Bircher is a native of Bland County, Virginia. She came to work in January of 1942. Rowena Becker is a native of Henderson, North Carolina, and came to work in July of 1942. Vivian Adair is a native of Clinton, South Carolina. She came to work in July of 1943. Kathleen Wicker is a native of Hamlet, North Carolina. She came to work in 1945. Emma Jean Landrum grew up in Franklin, North Carolina, and she came to work in 1946. Laura Bateman is a rare local native of Newport News, Virginia, <laughs> and came to work in 1947 or 1948. She'll have to see which one. <laughs> Katherine Johnson is a native of White Sulphur, West Virginia, and she came to work in 1953. We also have with us today Virginia. Crude work that we were doing in a way. It, it wasn't crude, it was very technical. But looking at it now, you would think it was, where we uh, calculated all of the results that were brought to us by hand uh, from the wind tunnel um, and put it on sheets of paper, which you can see uh, some of these, some of the data sheets. One is there's an original by Rowena Beck over here. Um, we stayed in the pool, the computing pool. I stayed in there for a few weeks, about three weeks, I think. and. Uh, and which that we sat with a calculator in front of us. It might have been a comptometer, those awful sounding noisy things. Or a Marchant, which my boss liked best. She she insisted on using a Marchant herself. Or a Frieden calculator, it was a big this big and a hand calculator mechanical, in which we sat and we wrote down, you know, we calculated this big and we put the, took the data from over here wrote down laboriously this column of paper, not only on, of, of numbers, not only that, but then we passed it over here to Rowena, and Rowena recalculated that, or, or Imogene or somebody who was in the pool, recalculated that, but put a little red dot by any one that she might find that was wrong. Anyhow, after a while, um, I heard that, that some of the sections were going to by the way, they not only called us computers, but we had the demeaning uh, title of junior computer something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get in because I, I had a math major and uh, from around of Michael Women's College in Lynchburg and, and had been on with my master's at Columbia, and so I, I did come in as a computer, $1,620 a year. And, um, that lasted a pretty good long time because our, our, our salary sort of got stuck. But anyhow, um, I heard that we were going to be uh, sent maybe out. Some of the divisions wanted their own people right there instead of having to send the men down, up and down the streets. I'm looking forward to hearing. Is this right? Okay. I'm looking forward to hearing many of these stories. I don't think I should. I put this on the table. Oh, okay. Make sure it doesn't point to the speaker. Is this okay? No, it's still. We'll take a momentary timeout. We'll call this a, uh, as in the football games, a uh, TV commercial timeout. <laughs> what should I'll I do with this? Uh, just leave it there, oh. please, and Sam will <coughs> adjusting on the game. 
think these oh. microphones are supposed to take care of all of your... Try it again. Okay. Okay. It's on. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah. Are we ready? Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have today. <laughs> In a minute, we're going to have it. I think some of our new equipment's not working right. Talk it's on. Okay. I'm looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have today. Is this okay? All right. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the, the discussion is entitled, when, when Computers Were Human, and we're going to get first-hand information or oral history from some of these women who actually we're, we're, we're still, still not we're doing still very good. Some problems. Well, should we maybe they just turn this off? Will I be picked up from there? <laughs> it's not that big. Well, I'm not going to do that much talking once I get this okay. going. All right, Kristen, so you right up on the speaker right okay. there. What that does is the feedback. I'll, Actually, I'll, if, I'll if, just you, try if you lean back a little, instead of leaning forward as you've been doing that. Okay. Well, we'll try one more time. <laughs> Suppose I just turn it off. Yeah, then we don't get it on the tape. Oh, okay. You can turn it off, but the tape will <laughs> I can. Okay. Okay. We're going to get first-hand information. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the high sound, which I just got. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our regular Thursday night lecture series. And uh, obviously, today's presentation is a little bit different. Uh, of course, it's not Thursday night, but Thursday afternoon, and we don't have a lecture. Outside of that, it's quite similar. Uh, today, we are really delighted to uh, uh, go astray from our normal uh, procedure because we have a very, very special treat uh, for us. As some of you are aware, hopefully all of you at least a little bit aware, that. Uh, Many years ago, before the advent of the uh, computers and supercomputers, that uh, uh, NASA employed a large number of women to do the calculations that our uh, machines now take care of. And today, uh, we have a number of distinguished uh, uh, speakers, women who were the computers way back when. Uh, as the moderator, Again, a slightly different uh, change from a normal procedure. We have Lona Hauser. Uh, Lona is a newcomer. Uh, she only got here in 1961. So it's not quite 30 years that she's been here, and pretty soon we'll almost consider her a native. But uh, she came here, as I said, in 1961, towards the end of the era when these women were functioning as uh, computers. Uh, she has worked with them. She has known them. And uh, she has made the, uh, uh, the transition and has uh, stayed through that uh, right now she's uh, working the uh, computer applications branch. So she has certainly seen and participated in the full range of the women serving as computers, now through a woman who is having a computer serve her. And again, we welcome not only uh, Lona Hauser, who will introduce our distinguished panel of uh, speakers, and I will now turn the program over to her. Lona, thank you very, very much. Now shall I turn this on? Now you can turn it on. <laughs> 